Coming up on Network Africa. At least 19 people killed by landslide in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Kenya's opposition leader Raila Odinga calls off anti-government protests for today and to embark on dialogue with President William Ruto. Undercover operation reveals Zimbabwe's main influential diplomats, Hubert Sango, involved in gold smuggling schemes. the program today. I'm Anne Wawado. We begin with stories and happenings that made headlines over the weekend. U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris on a week-long tour of Africa urged Zambia's bilateral creditors to expedite the restructuring of its debt. Harris said the government in Lusaka had put in place measures to strengthen its economy and should be supported with debt relief. She was speaking at the start of a two-day visit to Zambia. We are continuing to reiterate our call for all bilateral official creditors to provide meaningful debt reduction to Zambia. And that includes the calls that we were making in the context of the IMF, that that be done. But let me be clear, our presence here is not about China. It's about an independent understanding of the intertwined histories of our nation. Zambia has been looking to restructure its debt since becoming the first African country to default during the COVID-19 pandemic in late 2020. Meanwhile, Kamala Harris visited Panuka Farm in Zambia on Saturday and reiterated the USA's promise of $7 billion in private sector commitments to support climate resilience, adaptation and mitigation across the African continent. The trip has been about what we can do to cultivate and grow public-private partnerships, how the United States government can work with African leaders, African corporations, U.S. corporations, nonprofits, philanthropists, to bring resources together, to combine those resources, to uplift and grow these kinds of models of innovation in a way that will spur and encourage this kind of work across this continent and across the globe. This work then that we are doing with the private sector, as I announced yesterday, will, because of the, the work that I've done to help generate more than $7 billion in private sector commitments, will support climate resilience, adaptation, and mitigation. This includes commitments to support climate smart agriculture, to increase access to financing and insurance, which is a very big deal, um, to more on this continent than 116 million farmers, which is about half of the farmers on the continent. Panuka Farm is a Zambian-owned farm that uses climate-smart agricultural techniques and digital tools to increase the quantity and quality of crops. Still on Saturday, Team Malaysia, skippered by Germany's Boris Herman, glided across the finish line of Ocean Life Park in Itajai, Brazil, to win leg three of the ocean race. The victory came on the 35th day of racing over 14,714 nautical miles from the start of the leg in Cape Town, South Africa, on February 26th. <laughs> And on Sunday, Ethiopia's Abaji Ayana won the men's race at the Paris Marathon in his first competitive run over the distance, and Kenya's Hila Kiprop claimed the women's title. The 20-year-old Ayana won with a time of 2 hours, 7 minutes and 15 seconds. In the women's race, 37-year-old Kiprop crossed the line in 2 hours, 23 minutes and 19 seconds after a stunning comeback. 
To other stories now, at least 19 people have been killed by landslide in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. According to local officials in the village of Bowa in North Kivu province, the death toll is likely to rise. Officials say some members of a group of women and children who have been washing laundry in the mountain stream were buried after the ground collapsed beneath them. Search and rescue operation for more victims is expected to continue today. The region has been battered for months by heavy rains, which have triggered flooding and mudslides. Meanwhile, the first batch of South Sudanese soldiers have arrived in Goma in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo. The group of at least 45 soldiers are joining a regional military force in the region, racked up by M23 rebels. The seven-nation East African country military force was created last June. It is due to oversee the withdrawal of M23 fighters from the eastern part of the DRC. Much of the region is plagued by dozens of armed groups, a legacy of regional wars that fled back in 1990s and the 2000s. And since re-emerging from democracy in late 2021, M23 rebels have captured swaths of territories in Kiva province and advanced within several dozen kilometers of its capital, Goma. Let's head to Kenya, where opposition leader Ray Odinga has called off protests planned for today to allow for more partisan discussions and formation of the country's electoral commission. Mr. Odinga spoke an hour after President William Ruto asked him to call them off and allow for dialogue. The opposition has been protesting twice a week against the cost of living, the formation of a new electoral commission, and the questioning of president's election last year. President Ruto has agreed to one demand and proposed a bipartisan engagement in Parliament on the reconstitution of the Electoral Commission. But his statement did not mention the cost of living. He has also asked Mr. Odinga to respect the Constitution and the Supreme Court, which validated his election last year. In his speech, Mr. Odinga acknowledged the president's calls for dialogue and described Mr. Ruto's statements as important. But he warned that protest would resume within one week if the talks did not bear any fruit. Meanwhile, East African bloc Igad has raised and praised Kenyan President William Ruto and the opposition leader Ray Odinga for agreeing to hold talks aimed at ending two weeks of protests about the cost of living and the electoral reforms. Igad Executive Secretary Wokne Beyehu said the two leaders' move will help resolve differences on national issues through peaceful means and preserve Kenya's unity and constitutional order. The cancelled opposition demonstrations would have been the latest in series of protests held on Mondays and on Thursdays. Well, let's bring in Kenyan journalist Brian Mwenda for more on this. He joins me virtually from Nairobi in Kenya. Thank you very much, Brian, for joining us on Network Africa. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Uh, thank you. Uh, this dialogue between opposition leader Ray Lodinga and Kenyan President William Ruto seems like a good start. What do you think? Speak to us about it. Well, um, this has been championed by a number of diplomats, a number of religious leaders, a number of political leaders, and a number of friends of the country too. Uh, where yesterday we saw the president at around 6 p.m. Kenyan time come out and address the nation where he said and asked the opposition to call up the uh, weekly demonstrations saying that he is ready to sit down on the negotiation table and have a bilateral talk by 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 partisan talk uh, where the opposition was going to engage and is going to engage with the government wing and really understand what are the matters that the opposition is on the streets about. And one hour later, the uh, opposition leader and the Azimio uh, presidential candidate for the last year's uh, presidential election, Raila Odinga, called for another press conference where he addressed the media and asked that, uh, and first said that that was positive development saying that it is important that we can have a dialogue as a nation. But also, he said that the uh, he, he gave a few conditions for the same thing that first, 
all the protesters who were arrested during the demonstrations must be released. Another thing he said is that within a week of no, of no uh, tangible results or outcome, they are going to go back on the streets. He said again that he is willing to sit down on the negotiation table under the by uh, by by uh, partisan talks, and by but by by saying but these are bipartisan talks, it means that they are going to the parliament to discuss these issues. Now the president did touch on a few issues here and there. However, um, some others still he didn't touch on what the opposition leader had um, highlighted during the demonstrations. But Brian, are you saying that there are no demonstrations today? We know that demonstrations are planned for twice a week, Monday and Thursday, and today is Monday. What is going on as we speak? So Normalcy has returned into the city of Nairobi where major demonstrations were being witnessed. Um, today morning as I was coming to work, uh, there was jam, there was traffic jam, which was a sign that things are back to normal. And actually uh, everything, businesses are back to normal. But the government through the deputy president has also said that the government will be keen on any quote unquote gunt or any, uh, dem uh, any demonstrations or any destruction of property as has been seen. Uh, Mr. Ruto has agreed to one demand, just one so far. That's the proposition of a bipartisan parliamentary committee to work through the concerns they have over electoral process and other things. Now, it seems as though Ray Laudinga is still not satisfied with election outcome because, I mean, he insists the polls were stolen. What do you think about this? Now, in his state of address um, that he had uh, yesterday, the president, uh, William Ruto, he said that um, he's ready to sit on the negotiation table. However, he remained non-committal on opening the server, which is part and um, which is key. A key, it's an integral part of the opposition's ask that the servers of the 2022 general election be opened, most of the presidential election. Now, this comes actually one day after the opposition released a website where they say that they have a whistleblower who has the real results uh, that were presented and that were of the 2022 general election, according to the opposition. Now the president has said that he, he will not open. Um, he has remained non-committal, actually. He is not going to talk about that uh, because he says that the Supreme Court on 5th of September 2022 conclusively uh, gave a ruling about the presidential petition, uh, which was laid in front of it. He is not going to talk about that. I mean, so many interventions have been coming from the United States, which has said that it was deeply concerned about the protest. The African Union has also appealed for a peaceful end to the chaos that saw the riot police firing tear gas at protesters and even water cannon at some of them. Do you think that this dialogue will yield fruitful results, remembering that Mr. Odinga has said that if it doesn't yield any result, then protest will continue? So in your own opinion, do you think that this dialogue will actually come to pass and actually yield results? Well, going by the development that has been happening today, the president has met with uh, parliamentary uh, leaders where he, quote unquote, is laying a framework of the negotiations. The, oppos the opposition leader uh, on the other side has not yet given out any um, update on the same, but however, he's going to come up with his own team because he said that the committee needs to be co-chaired. This means that the president is going to give his own team and one chairperson, and the opposition is going to give his, their own team with one uh, chairperson, and they're going to sit down as a committee in the parliament and discuss these issues. That's a step to the right direction. However, one thing we need to understand out of these talks is that they are politically, um, they are politically uh, developed in that this, compared to the previous uh, talks in between the former president uh, Uhuru Kenyatta and the current president, uh, he says that they're going to the parliament. The previous talks in between Raila Odinga and the former president were a little bit more personal, and we don't know what they discussed. But this time, they are willing to go to parliament and set the case uh, openly 
as an agenda. They're going to discuss every item in front of uh, in front of the media. And this means that, well, in case of any development, we're going to be witnessing. But uh, it is going to be a really tight one because being a parliamentary process, it's going to take some time because these are two people on the extreme ends of this bargain and to find an, equi uh, an equilibrium is going to take some time. But until then, let's wait. All right, while we wait, the president has not mentioned the cost of living crisis in this agreement. Now, Bob, give us an imagination or what the situation is like for the everyday Kenyan, an average Kenyan. What is life like mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. those people living there with the current inflation, especially? Absolutely. Talking about inflation, it is very important to note that the Kenya National Bureau of Statistics uh, did release some statistics uh, on 31st of March, saying that the country has witnessed a 9.2% inflation rate in the month of March. Now, the most affected uh, areas due to this inflation has been housing, electricity, gas, fuel, and transport. Now, the transport index, where most of these uh, these people do commute um, with, now the transport index went up by 0.3 percent, which means that uh, due to the fuel um, due to the fuel inflation that uh, happened on 14th of uh, March, when every month there is always a review by the Energy and Petroleum uh, Regulatory Authority. Now, fuel is up, a little bit up, and 9.2% is a little bit higher than the 8.8% that did happen globally last year. So according to the global uh, economic outlook last year, 8.8% .8 of the was the inflation rate. Now, 9.2% is the Kenya's inflation rate for this uh, past month, however, this, they say, is the normal or the average inflation rate according to the statistics that have been given. Now, away with the statistics. Now, the normal Kenyan, how are they feeling this? Um, basically, because of fuel, let me talk about uh, petroleum, went up uh, higher with two shillings uh, on 14th of March last, uh, last month. Mm -hmm. Talk about milk, one year down the line, uh, when we used to buy a 500 uh, ml packet of milk at 50 bob uh, of, of 50 uh, Kenya shillings, right now, something around uh, 55 or actually 65 to be to be precise, 65 Kenya shillings. Yeah. Talking Brian, about I, bread. I mean, that, that already even tells us what the difference in that number already we can imagine yes. what life is like for an average Kenyan. But thank you very much for your time on The World Today. Kenyan journalist Brian Mwenda, we hope to get to you soon to find out developments on this situation. Thanks a lot. Okay. Now, the President of the Republic of Rwanda, Paul Kagame, is asking citizens to always stand united and stay focused, just as he pays tribute to those who lost their lives in the genocide of 1994. He adds that the country has had its share of challenges, but it has been able to look inwards to find a lasting solution. We have to be accountable. Accountable to each other, accountable to others. Others even beyond our own selves as Rwanda, meaning accountable to others outside of our borders because at the end of the day, there is a way we affect them and the way they affect us. But we have had our ways always to look up to each other and look each other in the eyes and find a solution to our problems. We have had that. We have had our moment. In some cases, we have succeeded. In others, 
we have not been so successful. But I think we have succeeded more than we have failed. Welcome back. The United Nations General Assembly has adopted by consensus its annual resolution on breaking the link between armed conflict and the illicit trade of rough diamonds. The resolution was introduced by Lemogang Okwape, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Botswana, who said that the annual consideration of this agenda item provides an opportunity for the General Assembly to renew its commitment to ensuring that diamonds remain a force for economic development rather than armed conflict. Representing the African Union, the permanent representative of Sierra Leone, Fande Toure, noted the importance of the diamond trade. And elsewhere, one of Zimbabwe's most influential diplomats, Hubert Angel, has offered to use his status to launder millions of dollars through a gold smuggling scheme during an undercover operation. He was appointed ambassador at large and presidential envoy by Zimbabwe's president, Emerson Mgwanga, Mgwanga to in March, but Back in March 2021, he said that he will be able to carry large volumes of dirty cash into the country using his diplomatic status. The 44-year-old, who claims to be a prophet and heads a congregation, the Good News Church, which branches in 15 countries, said that he will facilitate a scheme through which unaccounted cash could be exchanged for Zimbabwe's gold. Recipients of the gold could then sell the precious metal for legitimate money, effectively turning their cash clean. Angel and his business partner, Ricky Doolan, also claimed that their laundering operations had the approval of Zimbabwean president, who has been in power since November 2017, when Zimbabwe's controversial former leader, Robert Mugabe, was ousted in a military coup. However, mass demonstrations are expected to hold across South Africa from Thursday, April the 6th, following this revelation by Zimbabwean elites. And in Kenya, a school in the western part of the country has been closed indefinitely after two students died of what is suspected to be a case of suspected food and water poisoning. Public health officials shut down a Mukumu Girls High School, a Kagamega County, which over 100 students were last week hospitalized with abdominal pains and diarrhea. Initial findings indicate that learners may have suffered food or water poisoning. According to the local media, samples were collected and sent to the Kenyan Medical Research Institute for analysis. Parents flocked to the school to collect their children after learning of the death of the two students. The United Nations Human Rights Office says it is still extremely worried about the impact of the UK government's plan to send more migrants to Rwanda if they arrive in the United Kingdom through illegal routes. UK Home Secretary has insisted that Rwanda is a safe country for the migrants. She said she believed the Rwanda policy would have a significant deterrent effect so that those people would stop making the journey across the channel to the United Kingdom. But the UN Human Rights Office has said the assessment done by the UN Refugee Agency shows the asylum system in Rwanda was not robust enough. Spokesperson Naveen Rashmadsani said that there are also concerns about respect for the right of freedom of assembly and the freedom of expression in Rwanda, adding that those concerns do remain till this very day. Well, that's it on Network Africa for today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu.